Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, the health, medicine, and bioscience edition. That's my job to find geniuses, what I term, in uh, all their fields, people that are one in a thousand. Um, what I've noticed is 95% of people in most fields are qualified and they're okay and 5% go above and beyond and really 0.1%, you know, one in a thousand are the top people. So I think I've got one today. It's Professor Oliver Rando. Uh, he goes by Ali Rando. He's at uh, UMass Medical School. We're going to be talking about epigenetics and epigenetic inheritance. So uh, Ali, thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so tell me um, first just a very brief definition of what epigenetics is to you, and then um, we'll go from there into your research. Yeah, so epigenetic inheritance is the inheritance of information beyond DNA sequence. Uh, And the easiest way for most people to think about this is, uh, by and large, every cell in your body has the same DNA. You all came from one fertilized egg. But when a liver cell divides, it never makes a kidney cell or a skin cell. It makes two liver cells. So not only do you pass on your genome, the book of instructions, uh, but you also pass on state liverness. And so this is an epigenetically heritable state. Uh, So that is the definition of epigenetic inheritance. And I thought for a while, um, scientists thought that all the epigenetic marks acquired in your lifetime or acquired, you know, before you conceive were erased when sperm and egg met. But I guess uh, at least some are preserved. What's the state of the knowledge there? Yeah, so uh, that is correct. The vast majority of epigenetic information is erased from one generation to the next. Uh, Obviously, for example, with the example of cell state inheritance, like liver cells, uh, you have to erase all the cell state inheritance because the fertilized embryo has to make every cell type in the body again. Um, So until uh, 20 to 30 years ago, it seemed like no epigenetic information was transmitted through sperm and eggs. Uh, Over the last 30 years, an increasing number of of examples have found specialized uh, cases where some epigenetic information survives the erasure process. So what's some of the information that survives that's a particular interest or usefulness or that's surprising? Well, so in mammals, the first example of this was in the case of imprinted genes. Uh, So these are genes where um, two people can have the exact same deletion. Uh, but they will have very different diseases. So, for example, Prader-Willi syndrome and Angelman syndrome are two diseases, uh, both of which are caused by deletion of one copy of an area of a chromosome. I think it's 15Q11. Uh, The difference is whether or not they inherited the deletion from their mother or their father. And so this was discovered in the late 1980s, and what it tells you is that that piece of DNA can remember whether or not it came from a sperm or an egg. So it remembers the the state of the parent it came from. Uh, So that's really the first, as I understand it, the first example of epigenetic inheritance in uh, in mammals. So specifically with your research, what are you trying to elucidate that, you know, which which marks are kept, which ones are not, or, you know, where have you gone with it? Yeah, yeah, so... uh, Unlike DNA sequence, epigenetic information does listen to environmental conditions. So the main carriers of epigenetic information are DNA modification, the packaging of DNA into chromatin, and uh, the production of mainly small RNAs, although maybe longer RNAs as well. Uh, And all of these things respond to environmental conditions. Uh, And so as people realize that some epigenetic information can be passed from parent to child, like in the case of imprinting, uh, it sort of raised again an old idea that perhaps environmental conditions experienced by parents could affect uh, disease states or health in their children. Uh, And so we've been focused on this, trying to understand whether any information in sperm uh, responds to the environment and affects kids. Uh, And more simply, the way we, we do the experiments is we take brothers, we take male mice, 
uh, and we subject them to different conditions, often different diets like a high fat or low protein diet uh, or drugs like nicotine, uh, then we mate them to females and then we see whether or not there are any differences in their children. Uh, and so we've found and many other labs have found that uh, a dad's environment can influence uh, some phenotypes in kids. Uh, most commonly people see metabolic phenotypes changing like glucose control. Uh, and so our interest now is in trying to understand uh, what the carrier of that information is, how it listens to the environment, and exactly how much information is transmitted from father to child. Well, in doing some reading, I saw that uh, there's prostosomes, you know, the prostate releases extracellular vesicles that affect the sperm and epididymosomes. So it seems like the sperm is not just sitting there growing in, you know, in an isolated way. It's being informed by other cells in the body up to the moment where it's released in the ejaculate you know, for a conception. Yeah, so uh, that's one of the most surprising things that sort of come out of uh, our work and other people's work in how paternal effects might, uh, might operate. Uh, because you know, classically you would think anything that's going to affect the molecular contents of sperm is going to affect... Uh, the testicle, which is where sperm develop. Uh, but it turns out that after sperm are done uh, being formed in the testis, uh, they look more or less like an ejaculated sperm, uh, but they continue to mature uh, in the rest of the male reproductive tract. Uh, and as you alluded to, uh, you know, sperm leave the testis and they pass through a tube called the epididymis, then they proceed into the vas deferens, and they go past the prostate and the seminal vesicle. Uh, and so it does seem as though after sperm are complete in terms of how they look uh, and the DNA they carry, they can continue to receive information in the post-testicular male reproductive tract. Uh, and that's uh, really been quite a surprising and interesting aspect of, of this literature. So what does this tell you about um, the father's health immediately before conception or a month or two out you know, beyond the cycle of um, sperm creation and growth and mat maturity? Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's an interesting question. So, you know, most of the work we've done, we've left mice on uh, on our perturbations, you know, whether it's a low-protein diet or nicotine, basically from the time we take them away from their mothers until they are sexually mature. So they're on these things for a very long time. Uh, and we haven't done a lot of exploration of what if we stress the mouse out a day before we made it. Um, a couple people have started to do more detailed uh kinetic studies, you know, where they look at stressing an animal a week or two weeks or whatever. Uh, and it does seem like you can tell your kids about things that happened in the last week or two. Uh, and that that's one of the pieces of evidence that supports the idea that uh, it's some of the information sperm gain comes after they've left the testis because they take at least two weeks to get from the testis to ejaculation. Uh, so that means that they have to gain this information in the post-testicular part of the, the reproductive tract. Um, on the other hand, it doesn't really make sense to tell your kids about, uh, you know, some mundane detail of, of the day you were experiencing before you procreated. Uh, and so I think there's a, a fairly open question of what kind of information you would tell your kids about if it just happened a few days ago uh, versus the kind of information you might integrate over your lifetime of experience. Uh, and these are things that, uh, you know, nobody has really looked into and we're quite interested in. Well, what effects seem to have the biggest effect on future generations? And how do you classify an effect, whether it has a, an effect on one generation versus two or three? Uh, well, so we have largely focused on children and have not looked at grandchildren or great grandchildren. So, you know, F1 for children, F2 and F3 are what we call them, um, what everyone calls them. Uh, uh, a number of studies have looked at F2s and F3s, um, not in our lab. And usually what people find is that if you see some paternal perturbation affects children, and let's say that causes a, you know, a change of 100% in some measurement. Um, usually the grandkids will so show the same kind of change, but much diminished, like let's say 20 to 30%, and maybe the great-grandchildren have a, a ghost of a change. Um, so it looks like it's the strongest in the next generation, and then it starts to fade away. Now, in terms of how big the changes are and you know what people call significant, which I think was the beginning of your question, um, 
we one of the things that the literature currently suffers from is that everybody who runs a paternal effect paradigm looks at a small number. By and large, they look at a not small number of phenotypes. So most commonly, people will look at the weight of the offspring uh, or how well they clear glucose uh, or how well they tolerate insulin. Um, so it's very few studies so far. I know some people who are doing this kind of stuff now, but people haven't really taken, uh, let's say, a control a child of a control dad and a child of a high fat dad and run really exhaustive batteries of uh, health and disease, you know, where you look at not just things like their glucose tolerance, but things like uh, how long they will stand on a plus armed maze or how well they do in an underwater maze, uh, underwater maze, um, so on and so forth. So I think at some point, we're going to have, we as a field are going to have to look at what changes in the kids in much greater and much broader detail. What about if um, you stress a mouse, you know, procreates, gives birth, and then you stress the children, and then they procreate and give birth? Has that been looked at? Are they reinforcing <clears throat> or additive effects? Yeah, that's that's a very good question, and there's uh, there's some reason from other species to think that that will be true. Uh, so there's some literature both in flies uh, and in worms. Um, actually, both of these studies, the the stressor they used was high temperature, uh, but they found that the the changes in in gene regulation they saw if you heat shock one generation of animals, if you heat shock great grandparents and then grandparents and then parents and then look at the next generation, there's a much stronger phenotype. Uh, so it does look like there's some buildup with uh, the number of ancestors who are exposed to something. I, to my knowledge, nobody has done this in mammals, or at least not very. There are one or two studies like with carbon tetrachloride, I think, but there are very few studies in mammals that have done this kind of thing. Because, you know, with mice, the generation time is three to four months. Uh, and so these are very long-winded experiments to do, especially if you have to look at lots of animals. Oh, yeah, I wonder if there's a, a lock-in ability where, you know, if, uh, if mice are exposed, let's say, to high heat conditions or stresses over three, four, or five generations, do you eventually lock in that trait, or does it begin to change the mouse even more significantly beyond an epigenetic level? Yeah, so there's, I mean, whether or not that happens depends a little bit on how the information is transmitted. Uh, so, for example, with uh, DNA methylation, which people have long sort of assumed would be the, uh, the mechanism in paternal effects, um, although we actually don't think it is, uh, but DNA methylation actually affects mutation rates. So DNA methylation, you either have a cytosine, which is one of the four canonical bases in DNA, or methylcytosine. Uh, and it turns out that methylcytosine mutates 10 times faster than cytosine. And so you could imagine that if you continuously stress an animal in a way that changes cytosine methylation, that would uh, actually increase the mutation rate at the regions of the genome you're doing this, uh, and that could lock in a phenotype. On the other hand, with um, the kinds of mechanisms we favor for our, at least our studies, which are small RNAs, uh, it's less clear that continually producing an excess of some small RNA and sperm from, you know, one generation to the next to the next would have any way, any obvious uh, mechanistic way of locking into the, the genome. Um, but certainly in the case of some of the epigenetic information carriers, there is, uh, there is good precedent for the ability of a long-standing change in epigenetic information to convert into genetic information. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. Is there a point at which you've observed that uh, the underlying DNA itself changes? Yeah. So uh, again, we've you know we've never looked past one generation. So we certainly haven't put ourselves in a situation to observe that. Um, but the uh, the possibility exists, and it's a it's obviously a fairly uh, exciting and appealing idea. Um, but it just simply hasn't been tested. And I think it'll be really challenging to test in mammals because it's the kind of thing you're going to have to have huge numbers of animals uh, that you're exposing to stresses for years worth of generations. Uh, so that's a, that's a sort of decade-long experiment probably. It's a good one and it's an important one, but it's going to take some doing. Well, instead of um, simple stresses, what about more complicated ones? What if there's a disease that affects mice that they recover from and you deliberately infect a generation, breed them, 
try to infect the next ones, breathe them, try to infect the next ones. That might be a more significant change that you might observe. Or same thing with there's a vaccine for mice against a particular virus, um, maybe one that endogenizes normally. Maybe it'll block it. Maybe it, who knows? Yeah. So uh, you know, in terms of now, viruses that get into the genome, that's a, whole, that's a whole separate ball of wax, right? Because there you're actually already changing the genome. Uh, and there are well-known defense systems that respond to new invasions of, of DNA invaders. Uh, and in fact, one of my colleagues just um, published a really interesting study on, on watching a, a new retrovirus spread through uh, wild koala populations. Um, but as far as things that don't involve, uh, you know, a, a stressor that directly incorporates into the DNA, like retroviruses. So, for example, with bacteria, uh, I think that's a, that's a very good idea, and it's something that we're actually we're starting to pursue with one of our colleagues. Um, but in any case, there's, uh, you know, I, I mean, I can see you're very interested in the idea that continuous epigenetic stimulation will, will be fixed, and um, I think there's certainly... Uh, viable mechanisms that can be envisioned that would do that. Um, but just nobody has, has set up the kind of, you know, even, even the, if you're only doing it for a couple generations, it's a few years experiment. And if the mechanism involves changing mutation rate, which even if you guide the mutation rate a little bit, it's still random. Um, those kinds of things are still going to be huge numbers of animals for a fairly long time. So it's, I think it's, uh, it's going to take somebody with very deep pockets to, to, and who's very patient to fund that kind of work. Yeah, or maybe in fruit flies, they have an even shorter generational span. Maybe you could uh, do 20 or 50 generations of them and see what happens. Mice, I guess, would yes. take a lot longer. Yeah, no, those uh, – and I, I wonder whether people have done – well, anyway, uh, yeah, no, those in flies and worms, those would obviously be much, much more straightforward experiments, both in terms of, you know, just having the space to maintain thousands of animals as well as the, um, the time it takes for generations. So what's the, the end consequence you, you think you're going to find from your research? What's it going to tell you? Well, I mean, I think, you know, the thing that I think people still, the thing it has already told us that I think is not widely appreciated by, uh, um, you know, by the population at large is that a father's environment does affect disease risk and health in children. So already, I think that's a fairly important change to our understanding of how parenting works, right? Because you generally think of dad as just providing half a genome and then, you know, hopefully he sticks around, but there's nothing else molecular that dad does. Uh, whereas mom, of course, doesn't drink during pregnancy and so on and so forth. Uh, and so I think one thing we already know from our research and others is that uh, we should be paying a little bit more attention to dads. Um, another thing that that implies is that for complex diseases like diabetes, you know, we obviously know that your DNA plays some role in your risk of diabetes. And of course, what you eat plays some role in, plays a major role in your risk for diabetes. Uh, but we can't explain everything about who gets diabetes and who doesn't. And maybe one of the things we're not looking at is what your parents ate. Uh, and so ideally down the road, we would have some idea of how to incorporate not just genetic and environmental factors into epidemiology, but also epigenetic factors. Uh, in terms of what I personally hope to learn over the coming decades, um, that would include things like how the system works from beginning to end, you know, how do fathers sense the environment in a way that communicates information to the sperm? How does what the sperm delivers to the embryo affect early development? And how do those changes in early development end up causing uh, changes in uh, metabolism and behavior and the rest of it down the road. Um, related to that question is how much information does sperm carry? Uh, are all of these things we do to stress animals basically telling kids about the dad's quality of life um, with all sorts of different stresses, all basically making life better or worse in terms of what you tell the kid? Uh, or do you tell the kid, really specific information about different kinds of stressors, like there was lots of cadmium around and it was too warm for my taste and I had to fight really hard to find a mate. Uh, so that's, if you, once you, uh, once you accept that dad passes some information to kids, then the deepest question after that is how much information does he pass to kids? And that 
remains, I would say, a, a totally unresolved question in this field. Well, what about the, um, you know, how the, the mice are raised? I remember a study where, you know, rat pups that were licked a lot and groomed by the mothers, you know, they had a whole different set of epigenetic marks versus ones where the mom didn't care. So, I mean, I'm sure you're controlling for, for instance, the mother's stressors and diet and conditions, but what about the, um, you know, the raising of the, of the mice babies? I don't know what you call mice babies. You know, have you seen any countervailing effects there? Pups? Yeah. So, I mean, that's a very, that's a very interesting question. Uh, so, you know, there you're, you're referring to uh, an old mini study where, um, rat mothers perform different amounts of, of maternal care, uh, licking, nursing, and arched back, uh, licking, grooming, and arched back nursing. Um, and depending on how much care they give to the kids, the kids change cytosine methylation at, at various genes. And then when the kids grow up, if they were groomed and cared for, they will become caring mothers. Uh, and if they weren't, they are uncaring mothers. And so that's sort of interesting in that during the lifetime of an animal, you're using molecular mechanisms to maintain the memory, but then the way information is passed from parent to child is not uh, a molecular passage, but is actually a cultural, you know, how much uh, care you give to the kid. Now, in the case of our kind of work, uh, we do the experiments in ways where the, the father doesn't have any direct experience with the kid, so we put the dads in to mate with a female for a day and then we take them out. Um, and in some cases, we actually uh, don't even have the mother uh, see the father. So one of the things we do to see where the information is, whether it's carried by sperm or in seminal fluid or in some more cryptic way, uh, we actually purify sperm and eggs. So we'll take a, a control male sperm and a low protein male sperm, and we'll take some oocytes and we'll carry out in vitro fertilization to make embryos. And then we will implant those control embryos into one female who's never seen either of the parents and will implant the low protein embryos into another female. And so by doing that, it's, uh, it's very hard to imagine a way where the father's experience would affect the level of care that that um, foster mother provides. So we don't think that there's that what we're doing in the system is affecting female care. Um, on the other hand, you could imagine that let's say the low protein embryo grows really quickly and forces the mom to provide it lots of placental, you know, placental nutrition. Um, and in that case, you would say, well, it's affecting how much care in some sense the mother provides to the, to the developing fetus, um, but it's not because of anything the mother saw. It's actually you know, molecular information in the embryo that affects how much care it extracts from mother. Um, so I guess to some extent, the way I'm answering your question is, we don't think the mother has any way of telling what dad did, what dad experienced, uh, but it's still the case that what dad provides to the embryo could impact the level of care that mother provides. Is that a meaningful distinction? No. Maybe not. I, I, didn't, I didn't think about that. Uh, I, I didn't think about it on a molecular level, it would alter the mother's behavior towards the, uh, you know, towards the pup, but I guess that's yet another way that it, it could happen. Yes. So um, in, when you look at the adaptation, you know, when you look at the, the marks that lead to a different phenotype, some of them, I guess, would be maladaptive for the pups' conditions. Let's say they were exposed to a lot of heat and the pups grow up in an environment where it's actually pretty cold most of the time. So you probably would consider that heat tolerance would be maladaptive or not helpful. And then there's other okay. phenotypic changes that maybe, maybe help the, um, the babies adapt and live better in their current environment. So do you characterize the changes that way? And then do you see that maladaptive traits get wiped out faster? Even within the, the same generation, do the marks come undone because the creature is maybe adapting to its environment as it lives or the marks are there, that's it for the whole generation? Yes. Well, so, I mean, I can, I can give you examples of adaptive and maladaptive. Uh, and then your question is also related to the question of, that you raised before of, uh, if you stress multiple generations, do the effects pile up, right? So if you, let's do the last one first. Uh, if you perturb just one generation of fathers and you see a phenotype in kids, that phenotype starts to fade in grandchildren and great-grandchildren, as we talked about before. Um, so then if you stress multiple generations, at least in flies and worms, the, the phenotypes in, in future generations get stronger and stronger. And so that, to some extent, is is uh, 
related to what you were just asking, right? So if the phenotype you see in kids isn't matched to their environment, then the, the phenotype fades with a few generations. Um, now, in, in terms of talking about adaptive, where you're talking about the ability of kids to have a next generation of progeny or even to survive, um, I can, you know, there are two pretty good examples on each side of that spectrum. So most famously, there's something called the thrifty phenotype. Uh, this is an observation based on a bunch of studies, for example, the Dutch hunger winter in World War II, where uh, children who were starved in utero have high rates of diabetes, obesity, and, and heart disease. Uh, and the idea is that mom tells them they're going to go hungry, they become very good at hoarding calories, uh, but then when they are not born into conditions of starvation, uh, hoarding calories is a maladaptive response. Uh, and so that's exactly the kind of thing you were talking about. Um, uh, on the other hand, in one of my favorite systems that we've worked on, if you uh, give dads nicotine, and then you inject the children with a, a lethal dose of nicotine, um, the kids of nicotine-exposed dads are protected. Uh, and so there, the kids are prepared for the environment you uh, subject fathers to. Oh, okay. But, um, do you see undoing of a given uh, set of marks during the lifetime of the child, for instance? Has that been observed? Uh, well, you know, we're at the point where the – we think, again, our favorite, we don't know exactly how our system works or our systems, the various things we study, uh, work at the level of what sperm is carrying to the embryo that causes changes in phenotype. Uh, so given that, I can't answer your question um, uh, precisely. But what we think the information is, is small RNAs, uh, and those have no way of being copied um, in mammals. They have ways of being copied in some other organisms. So Dad is delivering small RNAs at fertilization, which affects the way the early embryo grows and which genes it turns on. But those small RNAs are, are either diluted out or destroyed fairly quickly in development. So that, that mark is gone pretty quickly. Now, one of the big questions for us and for the field is how marks that are present for a short amount of time uh, cause long-lasting phenotypes or long-lasting changes to your metabolism and the rest of it by the time you are a, you know, 10 billion cell baby or however many cells there are in a baby. Um, so because we don't know what's carrying the information through, you know, all of development in, in mom and into the baby, we don't know what, uh, how to test your question of whether or not as the baby becomes a child and then a teenager and the rest of it, uh, how long that information persists and how long until it fades away. Mm. We don't even know where yeah. to look to answer that question yet. Oh, is science able to sequence someone's, not only their DNA, but epigenetically sequence them? Look at the methylation, look at the other histone activity? Yes, uh, and that's something that's, um, you know, everybody working in this field is is working on, uh, you know, I think first and foremost, most of us are, are trying to look at the epigenetic information in the sperm and eggs because that's the thing that starts the whole ball rolling. Um, but then the how perhaps transient information in sperm and eggs turns into longer lasting epigenetic information is, I think, the next question. Uh, certainly the techniques are around to look at, say, cytosine methylation or histone modifications. Um, in the child or in the fetus. Uh, the only difficulty with that is you really have to figure out which tissue is being affected. Uh, you know, so it's pretty expensive to look at cytosine methylation over the whole genome. And so if you take, you know, uh, a baby made from low protein sperm and you want to look at cytosine methylation, do you look at brain, liver, skeletal muscle, brown fat, kidney, uh, within the brain, do you look at specific regions? And so it, it's, again, one of these experiments that quickly becomes expensive and uh, laborious, uh, but it's the kind of thing that has to be done. Uh, and we and other people are pursuing that kind of thing. So you're verifying the epigenetic marks in what cell types then? Uh, so in terms of, we, so we've studied the epigenetic marks in sperm quite a bit. Uh, we've looked at cytosine methylation, where histones are retained, um, various classes of RNA, small RNAs and long RNAs. Uh, and we've looked at how all of those things change under different dietary and other conditions. In terms of looking at epigenetic marks in the children, 
Uh, we've looked at cytosine methylation in liver uh, and chromatin state in liver. Um, a wide number of other studies have looked at, with varying degrees of resolution and rigor, uh, have looked at a couple other tissues, like I know adipose tissue has been looked at for cytosine methylation in a high fat paradigm. I know some people have looked at brain, um, but all of these things, some people have looked at in the testis of the next generation. Um, but by and large, people will do these sort of one-off things in their system. And um, I think at some point, somebody is going to have to take an, an offspring and characterize epigenetic marks across a whole bunch of tissues in the same animal. Yeah. And you talked about methylation a bunch, but what other kinds of epigenetic marks are there? Um, so the three main carriers of epigenetic information are, are DNA modification, uh, cytosine methylation in particular, uh, chromatin state, uh, so the packaging of your six feet of DNA into a 10 micron nucleus uh, is accomplished by these spools called nucleosomes. Those things can carry hundreds of, about a hundred different covalent modifications, uh, and a subset of those modifications can be copied uh, during cell division. Uh, so that's another epigenome. That one's sort of a pain in the butt to characterize because there are so many modifications worth looking at. Uh, so it just multiplies the number of experiments by quite a bit. Uh, and then small RNAs uh, in other organisms can be have ways of being copied in terms of their levels. Um, in mammals, small RNAs do seem to play some of the same regulatory roles, but they don't maintain levels for as long. Uh, then there are other epigenetic information carriers that are uh, let's say, less likely to operate in sperm and eggs, but may operate during um, cell division in the progeny. So uh, transcription factors are how cells remember what kind of cell they are. Uh, actually, it's mostly transcription factors. Uh, and then the confirmation of certain proteins, prions, uh, can be maintained. You, proteins that can form prions can be maintained in a non-prion or a prion state, and that can be passed on for quite a few generations. So at least those five things have the potential to carry information uh, when cells divide. So I see why the uh, amount of work to do is like exponentially expanding. You can look at these five yes. different types of marks in 200 plus different cell types uh, based on all these yeah. Uh, stressors. Yeah, that's crazy. Over X number of generations, yeah. lots to look at. Yes, exactly. Huh. So all right, well, what, um, what do you sense is a near-term win that you're getting close to in your in your research or understanding? Uh, a near-term win. Um, or understanding, a new understanding that you feel like you're, you know, I, I guess maybe a little bit of speculation is what I'm asking. What's coming soon for your research or, you know, this field in general? Well, so we've started to, we've finally started doing an experiment that we should have done a long time ago, which is that we've been focusing on one particular RNA in sperm because we've, it's an, unusual class of regulatory molecule called a tRNA fragment, and we've been trying to figure out what it does at a molecular level, um, and its levels are affected by diet. Um, and we, a long time ago, we should have started adding it to control embryos to see whether or not it caused any kind of metabolic change in kids, to see whether or not it was, you know, the old necessary and sufficient test, uh, at least test the sufficiency of it. Uh, and so we've started injecting our favorite RNA into control embryos, and it turns out, uh, at least in early studies, it looks like we're making massive babies uh, by injecting this RNA. Um, and so I actually did not really think that one RNA was going to have uh, a really strong effect on, on programming changes in kids. I sort of thought it was because we have 10 or 20 RNAs that change levels, I sort of thought it might be some complicated interplay of all these RNAs. Uh, but it looks like, you know, the one RNA we're looking at the most has a very strong effect on, you know, pretty obvious metabolic parameter in the children. Um, so I think, you know, we, we don't, that experiment hasn't been done at, at the kinds of numbers you would need to be really sure of it, but it feels like it's going to turn out that way. Um, so, that's obviously very exciting, and it gives us a very defined paradigm to start to do some of the things you were asking about before. So we can inject this RNA into control embryos and then see what kinds of cytosine methylation changes there are in the liver of a fetus down the road. Um, it also raises the question of, you know, now that we're doing these experiments, other people have looked at uh, very different RNAs from us and injected them into embryos and seen metabolic phenotypes. And so what I'd 
really like what I'm really looking forward to is comparing in the same lab under the same conditions the activity of several different RNAs to ask whether or not they all do the same thing more or less or whether or not each of them gives you a different suite of of uh, characteristics in the next generation. Okay. Well, very good. Um, Ali, what, uh, what's the best way for people to read some of the papers you put out and keep tabs on what your research is doing? Uh, well, I mean, anyone who... So we try to publish most of our work in um, open access journals. Uh, okay. And so, and we... We now post everything before we publish it to uh, the preprint server, BioArchive, which is also uh, publicly accessible. Uh, so really all you have to do is, is look for my name on PubMed um, at NCBI, but if you Google PubMed, you can find it. Uh, and if you look up Rando O, uh, that'll give you a list of our papers, and um, most of them should be uh, accessible without an academic license, and anyone oh, who wants good. one that isn't publicly accessible, people can email me and I am always happy to send PDFs. All right, and last question, just for a primer on epigenetics, any good books that you've read that are accessible to the public, you know, the basics of it? Ah, that's a good question. Um, hey, for instance, I read Nessa Carey's book, which, you know, probably was accessible. I don't know if you had any recommendation. No, I don't read a lot. You know, that's an, uh, I should really have an answer to that question and I don't, I'm sorry about that. I. I have okay. books on epigenetics that I like, but, um, you know, they're not really primers about epigenetics. So there's this great book called The Case of the Midwife Toad by Arthur Kessler uh, about an early uh, Lamarckian, but that's not really what you're looking for. Um, so I'm sorry, I, I don't have a great answer to that. I'll have to come up with one for the next time I do one of these. Okay. Well, I'm glad you came. It's super interesting, and I appreciate you being here all the same. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.